Hi again. We are officially starting Unit 1, which is called What is Life Made Of? Uh, your book uses the word unit and Canvas uses the word module, but they mean the same thing. Uh, before you watch this video lecture, make sure you read Chapter 2, Chemistry and the Molecules of Life. In this lecture, we're going to discuss matter and molecules and how life is organized and what life is. Um, the, what the structural unit of life is, and the role of water, which is very important. If you haven't yet, please go check out the PBS video called We Are Star Stuff. There's a link to it under Module 1, Week 2, in the same page that you found the link to this video. It's about 14 minutes long and sets us up really nicely for the rest of the chapter. Hopefully it'll cut down on some of the rambling that I do too. Okay. Now that you've watched that video, um, I want to talk about this quote from Carl Sagan uh, that you see. It's one of my favorites, truly. The very atoms of your body are star stuff. These elements are released and freed to gather into planets and moons and people after a star sheds its gaseous layers or explodes in a supernova. Uh, think about it this way. Stars had to die so that you may live. It's a beautiful thought. Here's how it happens. Okay. Say a supernova occurs. Countless tons of matter, atoms of different elements, are scattered through space. Hydrogen, oxygen, calcium, carbon, phosphorus, and other elements. These, after they're blown into space, they collect into these clouds of gas and dust called nebulae. In this nebula, sometimes the matter will begin to collect and spin around a center of more dense gas. As that center of gas gains more mass from the matter around it, it starts to exert a stronger and stronger gravitational pull on the matter around it, pulling in more and gaining more mass and having more gravitational pull in a positive feedback loop. Meanwhile, some of the stuff around it that isn't pulled in starts spinning in a disk and within this disk, the same thing can be happening on a smaller scale. If you have a denser center orbiting this massive center, it can start to collect more dust, form a rocky sphere, or perhaps it's collecting gas and forms a gaseous sphere. These points are orbiting around this massive center, which meanwhile is still pulling in more gas and dust. Eventually, the center gains enough of mass that the gravity that is pushing down on its center is enough to fuse the nuclei of atoms together and induce thermonuclear fusion. This is how stars and solar systems are made. Now imagine on one of these orbiting spheres, maybe a rocky one, it was mostly dust and heavier um, silicates and things like this, like Earth is, on this sphere, some of these atoms are forming into complex molecules. Some of these molecules begin to develop into more and more complex structures. Some of them might develop the ability to self-replicate, to make copies of themselves that are the same as the parent copy. Some of these molecules might form um, a membrane that separates an internal environment from an external environment. In this way, the first cells are thought to have evolved. Remember, a cell is the basic structural unit of life. Later, some of these cells might begin to cooperate with other cells and form a colony. Now, this colony might uh, last long enough to develop cells that start to cooperate with each other with a specialized function. They might differentiate from other cells in that colony now what you don't, you don't have um, a colony of independent cells anymore. Now you have cells that are interdependent upon each other. This is a multicellular organism. That multicellular organism with specialized cells might have an advantage over other organisms in the environment and start to reproduce more often and make more changes. Some of these specialized cells which are working together can become tissues these tissues might 
come together with other tissues and make an organ, and that organ might connect with other organs to form an organ system, like your di digestive system or your circulatory system. And several of these organ systems together form an organism. This organism might continue to evolve and develop reason and thought and begin to study the world around it, study itself, a human, from star stuff. We are very much the universe studying itself. Certain molecules are a little bit more interesting to these self-studying universe pieces that we like to call biologists. Uh, organic molecules are those that contain a carbon backbone and at least one carbon hydrogen bond. Uh, an example is glucose shown here. You see carbon and you see carbon bond into hydrogen is pretty simple. When we're talking about science, organic does not mean free range or grass fed or hormone free. It just means there's some carbon and it's bonded to some hydrogen. I keep talking about carbon, so clearly it must be important to life. Carbon is the second most common element in your body after oxygen. Carbon makes up about 18.5% of your body. Uh, this is because of carbon's versatility chemically. Carbon has four valence electrons. Those valence electrons are the ones on this outer energy shell right here. You see four valence electrons. This uh, outermost orbital has eight spaces for electrons. Since it has four electrons, it has four open spaces which are available for bonding to other elements. This means that carbon can bond with up to four other things. It can bond to four hydrogen atoms and make methane. It can bond to other carbon atoms. It can double bond to oxygen and form carbon dioxide, which in that case is not an organic molecule. But it is an example of carbon's extreme chemical versatility. It can form a very wide variety of molecules. Um, interestingly, silicon has the same valence structure, um, which means it can do the same thing. It has the same chemical versatility, but carbon is much more common in our universe. It's a lighter element, and so what we find is carbon-based life, not silicon-based life, at least on Earth. Our cells are constructed mostly of water and organic macromolecules. These are large molecules that are organic, so they contain carbon and some carbon bonded to some hydrogen. Um, there's usually also a bunch of oxygen, um, some nitrogen, phosphorus, a little bit of sulfur sprinkled in there. These micromolecules, macromolecules, have um, subunits called monomers, which can link together to form the polymer structure. Carbohydrates are probably familiar to you. Uh, these are both complex carbs, such as starch, a section of which is shown here, um, and also simple sugars, such as glucose. Glucose is a monosaccharide, which is a monomer of a sugar. Uh, starch would be an example of a polysaccharide. Carbs are very important to your cells. They're used both structurally um, and as well as for energy production. They're perhaps one of the most important energy molecules. Now we also have proteins. Proteins are also primarily used for structural purposes, but there's a little bit of energy you can get from there too. Uh, the monomer unit of protein is called an amino acid. We'll learn a lot more about those later. These amino acids form chains which can fold into amazingly complex shapes like this uh, wacky little thing down here below the starch molecule. Now, nucleic acids, these are DNA and RNA. Um, they're incredibly important structurally, though we don't really get energy from them. The monomer form of a nucleic acid is called a nucleotide, and again, we will learn more about these in detail later. Lipids, these are fats, oils, waxes, um, these are important structurally because they form our cellular membranes, which, you know, kind of need that. Um, and they're also very important for energy storage. Sometimes they're a little bit 
too efficient for energy storage if you live in an era with plentiful food production. Uh, lipids tend to form a structure which has a hydrophilic end and a hydrophobic end, which enables them to form structures that don't mix with water. Uh, that's important, too. So those are the molecules of life that we just talked about. All life forms that we know of are composed of these structural molecules, and they use these molecules for energy as well. There are some characteristics of life that enable us to classify living from non-living things. Um, first of all, we know that all living things grow. They gain mass at some point in their existence. In multicellular organisms like us, like humans, we go through mitosis to make more cells and make up a larger body. We grow. Um, this characteristic gets a little bit tricky, though, when you're talking about things like bacteria. Uh, bacterial colonies grow. When you hear about bacterial growth, they mean the colony or, you know, whatever mass of bacteria is growing wherever. But if you look at individual cells, they only really grow when they're just about to divide. They divide in a process known as binary fission. Um, after binary fission, you get two daughter cells. Now, each of these daughter cells are the same size as each other, and they're the same size as the parent cell prior to binary fission. You might say that they're born in their adult size. So this characteristic isn't quite clear. Uh, when you're talking about all life forms, bacteria are definitely alive. In addition, there are non-living things that grow, such as crystals or fire, name anything. By itself, this characteristic isn't enough, so we need more. Homeostasis is the balance of internal factors within a body, such as temperature, salinity, or pH. This body can be multicellular or cellular. All living things exhibit homeostasis. Uh, this obviously requires separating your internal environment from your external, which is why that cell membrane is so very, very important. All cells do have cell membranes, which helps them with uh, maintaining homeostasis. Some cells also have a cell wall, such as bacteria, plants, um, fungi. The, uh, I want to add to real fast, the cell membrane also has some proteins some more structural units, which help regulate the flow of solutes uh, into and out of the cell as uh, well as water, and this helps to enable the cell to maintain homeostasis. All living things do sense and respond to stimuli. This probably makes you think of quick reflexes, like pulling your hand away from a hot pan or something. But it also includes slower responses, such as a tree growing toward the light, um, maybe antibiotic genes spreading through a population of bacteria. That's also a response to environmental stimuli if you're undergoing antibiotic treatment. That We'll talk about this when we talk about evolution, so I'll save that story. Um, but in a nutshell, those responses do lead to evolution, so it could be said that all living things evolve in response to stimuli from their environment. All of these processes that we've talked about so far require energy. So naturally, all living things must be able to get energy and to use it somehow. The familiar organisms to us get their energy by metabolizing those organic macromolecules, such as carbs or fat. There are some organisms that can make those molecules from the energy of the sun through photosynthesis or from chemicals in deep sea hot water vents through something called chemosynthesis or through ingesting other organisms or dead organic matter. Living things reproduce to pass on their traits. This is why DNA is so important. Uh, this can be both sexual reproduction as well as asexual reproduction, such as the binary fission in bacteria that I told you about, or cloning in whiptail lizards. Look it up. Um, this characteristic also has problems, though. Um, a good example would be mules, which are a hybrid between a horse and a donkey. Uh, mules are infertile, they're sterile, except in extremely rare circumstances. They cannot reproduce. 
uh, either with other mules or with horses or with donkeys. This is an entire species of living things that cannot reproduce. It does not fulfill this requirement of life. So this definition of life is very imperfect. Um, there are also issues with it when you look at some of the weird stuff in life. Um, your book does talk about this a little bit, but my favorite example is viruses, because viruses are cool. There's a lot of controversy in the scientific community around the life status of viruses. Outside of a host cell, sitting on a doorknob or wherever, uh, viruses don't do any of these things. They don't grow, they don't maintain homeostasis, they don't do any of these things. But inside of a host cell, they do. They do do all of these things. They have to hijack the host cell machinery to do it. But since the instructions for those actions come from the virus, not from the cell, you could easily argue that it is the uh, virus performing those tasks, not just the host cell. Um, I like to think of it kind of this way. So. There is a life stage in the virus where you could say that it's alive and a life stage where it clearly is not. This is similar to a spore from a mushroom. Um, the mushroom sends out this inactive particle called a spore. Viruses do the same thing. The host cell erupts and sheds all these inactive viral particles. These are sent out to find a suitable environment, such as in the case of the mushroom spore, a wet, shady piece of ground, or in the case of a virus, a susceptible host cell. Viruses represent the edge of our understanding in many ways. Um, it may be that through studying viruses, uh, we may discover the origin of ourselves. This is one of my favorite topics, but I don't have time. So if you want to know more about what I'm talking about, please Google the RNA world hypothesis uh, and go into that brief research with the understanding that many viruses use RNA instead of DNA as a hereditary molecule, though many also use um, DNA. But despite its flaws, this definition of life will do for now. As I've said before, life as we know it is made of cells surrounded by a cell membrane, ignoring viruses for the moment. This cell membrane is made of a lipid bilayer, two layers of lipid. Um, this bilayer, uh, this membrane does not mix with water because the hydrophilic heads that you see here, maybe I can get a color for you, these hydrophilic heads are facing outside of the cell in an aquatic environment as well as the internal, which is also aqueous, environment of the cell. This hydrophobic tails, meanwhile, come together into the middle so that water doesn't cross this membrane. This is dependent on being in water or any other polar um, solvent. Uh, your book gives you details on that. This organization of cells with this lipid bilayer for a cell membrane, uh, it exists because the solvent that life evolved in was water. This uh, structure, the structure of, um, you can think of it like a ball uh, surrounded by this lipid bilayer, this fatty bilayer, is called a liposome. Okay. Lipo is Greek for fat and soma for body, so it's just a fatty blob that happens to have um, these molecules for life in it. A cell membrane is an example of a liposome. So these are the structures that we expect to find surrounding the cells in life forms from watery environments like Earth and how we think Mars used to be. Now, Mars, we spend billions of dollars sending rovers and probes to Mars to search for evidence of life. Mars used to be watery like Earth. We do know this now. Uh, but Mars is smaller than Earth, so its liquid metallic outer core cooled already. They think this will eventually happen to Earth as well. When that happened, it was no longer inducing a magnetic field on Mars. Uh, and because water is volatile, what happens is when you lose 
your magnetic field, the solar wind starts blowing away your atmosphere over millions of years. Water being volatile evaporates out and then likewise gets blown away by the solar wind and thrown into the outer reaches of the solar system. We're not looking for Martians on Mars, we're looking for fossil evidence of extinct life on Mars. That might help us understand the origin and perhaps even the fate of life on Earth. There is another prospect for life in our solar system, and it does currently still have water. Uh, Europa, um, which is a moon of Jupiter, actually has more water than Earth does. Here, this picture shows a side-by-side -side comparison of Earth and Europa with all of the water fresh salt, uh, ice, everything gathered up into this other sphere. You see that despite Europa having a much smaller mass than Earth, it has a little bit more water. Europa is completely covered in water, no land masses. It has a water ice crust that's, I think, about um, three miles thick, and it is covering a liquid water ocean up to 60 miles deep, very thick. They think that this uh, liquid water ocean is warmed by something called um, tidal flexing in the core of the moon as it orbits around Jupiter. It gets kind of stretched and pulled like putty, which heats up the core, which heats up the, the liquid water ocean. Uh, NASA is actually planning a flyby mission to Europa uh, in a few years, in the 2020s, they say. Uh, they're going to search for evidence of life in Europa. Who knows what we'll find? There's also another moon in our solar system that may hold some secrets to life. Titan is a moon of Saturn. Uh, it also has water, but it is so cold there isn't any tidal flexing here, and it's on the surface. This water forms ice, and it's what the mountains of Titan are made of. Uh, there are lakes and seas, but they're not made of water. They're made of methane largely and ethane as well. These are organic molecules that are gas here on Earth, but that cold they form liquid. Um, so methane is organic and it's also non-polar. It's kind of the opposite of water that way. So they expect that if life does exist on Titan, it might form instead of this lipid bilayer, instead of a liposome with hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails, it might form something called an azotosome, which uh, comes from the French azote for nitrogen, I'm probably saying that wrong, uh, which has nonpolar regions interacting with the methane solvent and polar regions in the middle of the membrane, a flipped version of our lipid bilayer. There's research on Titan actually being conducted at Lowell Observatory. So if you're in Flagstaff, it's right up the hill on Mars Hill in Flagstaff. I suggest you go check it out. It's a lovely place to be. They have an event called Meet an Astronomer, which occurs every Friday and Saturday evenings during the summer. So by the time you watch this video, they'll probably be done. But if you're around next summer, check it out. You might get to meet someone on the front lines of this research on Titan. Okay, so we've learned about the molecules of life, carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, and lipids. Some of the most important structures that proteins can form are called enzymes. These are molecules that uh, are very important to life because they speed up chemical reactions both inside and sometimes outside of our cells. In this way, there are catalysts. They speed up a chemical reaction, but these are um, biocatalysts, so we call them enzymes. For your assignment this week, your first uh, lab, you're going to explore how certain factors such as temperature and pH affect the function of a certain enzyme called renin. Uh, you can access this lab and instructions from Module 1, or uh, as the due date draws near, you may see it on the home page. On the right side of your screen, you'll see a list of uh, assignments, activities, quizzes, um, and labs like this one uh, under Coming Up. So you can access it from there as well. Okay, in summary, 
basic structural unit of life is the cell, short and sweet. All right, these cells are constructed of complex organic macromolecules. Uh, the cells are separated, in our case, from an aquatic environment by a lipid bilayer cell membrane, uh, which so far, all of life as we know it has one of these. That's one of the reasons why water is so important, it, because it's a polar solvent. Your book describes more reasons why this polar solvent is so important. So make sure that you understand that and ask me any questions. Um, life, as we know, is defined by these five essential characteristics that you see on your screen, uh, which is a little bit imperfect, but it's very helpful for classification of a very chaotic world. After viewing this video lecture, you should go on to complete the lecture two quiz. After that, uh, do your enzymes lab and do discussion two, where we're further going to discuss life on other worlds. Have a wonderful week.